Hello and welcome to News Central Now. I am Adebola Adeduba. The top stories are this hour. Presidency denies 105,000 Naira minimum wage proposal as labor awaits government offer. Atiku demands probe of allegations the federal government spent 3.6 trillion Naira on few subsidy payments. Ramaphosa six national unity government after ANT fails to secure outright majority in polls. And details shortly. Let's begin by telling you that the presidency has denied reports that the federal government is proposing a new minimum wage of 105,000 naira. And third stage, special advisor to the president on information and strategy, Bayo Ononuga, dismissed the reports as false. The speculation followed a presentation at the presidential villa outlining the cost implications of implementing a new minimum wage to the president, Abola Chinobo. However, rumors circulated that the finance minister had proposed 105,000 naira as part of the new minimum wage template. Meanwhile, the Tripartite Committee on National Minimum Wage has postponed its meeting again, this time to Friday today, due to the unavailability of the cost template for the new minimum wage. This marks the second postponement within 24 hours. The federal government of Nigeria has called on Christian leaders to collaborate with government and join efforts aimed at nation building. The call to action was made known by Secretary to the Government of the Federation in Abuja as he met with Christian leaders at the National Christian Center. Our correspondent, Joshua Imarai, tells us more. It was a gathering of Christian leaders in the nation's capital, Abuja, as they convened to discuss issues surrounding nation building. Secretary to the government of the Federation, who was a guest at this event, called on the Christian leaders to contribute their quota to the process of nation building. The role of the church in affairs of nation is timeless. Even in those days in the past, Church and state had cooperated in ensuring the success of the state. This country is one of the most blessed in the whole world. And therefore, working together with you, the sky is the limit. While addressing the challenges facing the nation, he says that the current administration inherited the turbulent economy. We took over in a very turbulent weather. Foreign reserves were zero. So many things. And that was what there were massive reforms carried out by the president. One of them, which will appear to be a little bit tough for people to understand, is subsidy remover on fuel. He also took time to express his views on the recent minimum wage impasse between labor and the government. When they started with 600, which we moved it into 9.9 trillion, what we get the money? Four point is going to be seven. When they move, they're not moving. Let us work in the interest of this country. 100,000. I can't afford to pay my driver 100,000 because they are four. Then and these other people dependents. The SGF assured that government will continue to come up with initiative across multiple sectors of the economy to cushion the effect of inflation and support the nation's economic well-being. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarayi. The 2023 presidential candidate for the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, has called on the National Assembly to investigate alleged secret fuel subsidies under President Bola Tinobu's administration. In a statement released by his media advisor, Paul Ebe, on Thursday, Atiku urged the federal government to take responsibility for its policies and their consequences, ensuring accountability to Nigerians. Atiku emphasized the importance of the National Assembly prioritizing an investigation into the matter rather than focusing on less critical issues. This call for transparency comes after a leaked document revealed that the government spent 3.6 trillion naira on subsidies in 2023 
and projected expenditures of 5.4 trillion naira for 2024. However, the presidency in a statement by Special Advisor on Information and Strategy, Bayo Ononoga, refuted these claims, stating that the leaked documents are part of an ongoing policy formulation process and urged the public to, dis to disregard them. Staying in Abuja, the House of Representatives have passed for the third reading the 2024 Supplementary Appropriation Bill for the Federal Capital Administration of about 98.5 billion naira. And this was as the Chairman of the House Committee on the Federal Capital Territory presented his committee's report saying the appropriation bill earlier presented by the President has been thoroughly scrutinized and should be considered for the needed development of the capital. The submission was then unanimously adopted by the House and the Committee of the Whole. That this House do consider the report of Committee on Federal Capital Territory, the Bill for an Act to authorize the issue of the Federal Capital Territory Administration Statutory Revenue Funds for the Federal Capital Territory Administration account, the sum of 98 billion 500 million only for the capital projects for the service of the Federal Capital Territory Abuja for the financial year ending 31st December 2024. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I stand here to plead with the House to read the bill for, this, for the third time. 500 million only for capital project for the service of the Federal Capital Territory Abuja for the financial ending 31st December 2024 and approve clauses 1 to 5, which is the recommendation 1 to 5, the shadow explanatory memorandum and the long title of the bill. President Bola Tinubu has commissioned the B6, B12 and Seco roads within the Federal Capital Territory as part of efforts to complete all abandoned infrastructure. President Chinobu, who was represented by the President of the Senate, Godwin of Mabiu, says that the road is proof of the current administration's commitment to infrastructural development within the country. Our correspondent, Amadine Ui, tells us more. The road, which serves as a major transit highway within the federal capital, had been awarded 17 years ago. The ministers of the federal capital say the road is key to development within the capital. This road was awarded 14th of May 2007. 14th of May 2007 at the cost of 48.5 billion naira. And then it was revised in January 2021 at the cost of 98.8 billion. This new road infrastructure stands as a testament to our commitment to progress and prosperity. It will not only enhance accessibility to key areas within the central district, but also contribute to the overall social economic development, growth and growth of our dear region. The minister of the FCT, Yinson Wiki, says that the road is testament to the renewed hope agenda of President Bola Tinubu, which is focused on providing results for citizens. When you talk about renewed hope, a road that was awarded 2007, just one year of the administration of Mr. President, the road has been completed. This is what we are talking about, leadership, leadership. Is key. With the right leadership, we get the right results. Because we have the right leadership back, we are getting the right results. Everything happening here, thanks to the new group of Nigerians. I'm surprised that you pointed out that the ones we are about to commission were awarded in 2007, just about two weeks before I was sworn in as a governor. And I left the ownership 17 years ago. So you can imagine, we took only 17 years. And under one year of our civil people and material use administration, the progress has been commissioned. The President of the Senate, who had represented the President, 
says that the road network will boost economic activities within the city center. Today, as we commission these strategic goals, we are not just opening pathways from asphalt and concrete. We are also paving the way to enhance economic activities, improve accessibility, and a higher quality of life for our citizens. The road project marks the sixth project being commissioned by the president in the last one week. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. You're watching New Central now. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Legal experts have condemned cases of conflicting court judgments from several courts across the country, saying they are bringing the image of the judiciary into disrepute. This has once again been brought to the front burner as both the Federal High Court in Kano and the State High Court have passed conflicting court judgments in the light of the recent Emirates dispute with the two emirs in contention for the throne. Our correspondent, Marvelo Sabomaru, spoke with some legal practitioners and files in this report. The issue of conflicting court judgments in Nigeria has become a problem for the nation's justice sector as it has eroded the trust and confidence the public has on the judiciary. A notable case in mind is the current impasse ongoing in Kano State, northwestern Nigeria, over who the right and legitimate emir is. Two high courts, the Federal High Court and the Kano State High Court, have given conflicting interim injunctions regarding the impasse between the reinstated Emir Muhammad Sanusi II and the dethroned Emir Aminu Ado Bayero. It is therefore, like I said before, improper in law for courts of same hierarchy to sit on the same issue and make pronouncements. As a matter of, uh, it is also called abuse of court process. People look on to us as, um, as um, ministers in the temple of justice. That's supposed to mean that um, as ministers in the temple of justice, our conduct, our pronouncements, our actions, processes we file, must be a reflection of the purity of justice. In a situation that the Kano State High Court has first presided over the matter, what would the Federal High Court have done in that instance? The position of the law in plethora of Supreme Court decision, especially in the case of Harry Benke, like I said before, is that when the court realized that its process is being abused, it should strike out the matter. The Chief Justice of Nigeria has summoned the chief judges of both courts to appear for a resolution on the matter. Despite details of the meeting not being made public, but there are strong indications that the National Judicial Council, responsible for sanctioning erring judges, will wade into the matter. Things are getting to a ridiculous level, very irredeemable level, what I refer to as almost a calamitous end of the nobility of the profession. Lawyers are supposed to be the light of the society. When you therefore allow darkness to overshadow your light, then gross darkness is then hovering in that society. Although the Federal High Court sitting in Kano has fixed June the 13th for ruling on the issue of jurisdiction in the case of the Kano Emirate Tussle, in Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Obomman. And now a bit of security stories. Nigeria's security agencies say much success has been achieved in the war against insecurity following renewed collaboration by security agencies, which has continued to rid the nation of violent, armed, and criminal groups. The Director of Media Operation, Major General Edward Buba, made this known at a joint press briefing by security, defense and response agencies in the nation's capital, Abuja. General Buba says the inter-agency collaboration by security agencies has resulted to laudable fits in the war against insecurity in the country. 
Our correspondent, Imanu Bagudu, tells us more. This press conference led by the Director of Defense Media Operation is an initiative under the Strategic Communications Interagency Advisory Policy Committee coordinated by the Office of the National Security Advisor. SCIPC has been established under the National Security Strategy 2019 and it has, among other responsibilities, uh, the responsibility to advise government on security uh, communication, to strengthen strategic communication as a first order capability in amplifying our national security objectives. Security agencies will focus on the following strategic priorities. We will focus on strengthening intelligence sharing mechanisms to preempt and counter security threats more effectively. The director of the Defense Media Operation, Major General Edward Buba, while giving an account of its mandate in the last one year, says that the committee, an umbrella body for the spokespersons of all Nigeria's security and response agencies, has recorded unprecedented feats. The Nigerian Customs Service generated exceptional revenue of about four trillion naira during the period. Some trade facilitation initiatives were also deployed by the service. And these include the implementation of the time release study, the advanced ruling system, and the authorized economic operator program. Additionally, officer skills and automated processes were enhanced through capacity building and technological advancement. Through the upgraded infrastructure development, the custom strengthened its operational capability. Also, the custom strengthened stakeholder engagement facilitated, which led to a more integrated approach to custom operations. He says that their activities are as a result of coordinated efforts being put in place to enhance national security and protect the lives and property of citizens. In Abuja for News Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. In an effort to enhance the implementation of child protection law in Borono State, Stakeholders brainstormed at a Child Rights Protection Symposium organized by Save the Children, the Faculty of Law at the University of Maiduguri and the Borono State Child Rights Implementation Committee. The symposium highlighted the importance of strengthening community engagement and dialogues to ensure the protection and well-being of children in the region. Our correspondent, Umaru Kirawa, has details. It is time for school and these youngsters were spotted playing football. An unfortunate situation of most children on the street whose parents were murdered during the Boko Haram insurgency. Stakeholders here discussed strategies for increasing awareness of child rights, promoting positive parenting practices, and building partnerships with local communities to prevent and respond to child abuse and exploitation. The right to education should be a justiciable right of every child. This is because Nigeria has enough resources to give free education to every child. Let's join hand in making sure that these children in the streets, through community dialogues and through implementation of the child protection law, which I am very much sure if fully implemented, the child protection law will give a very serious protection to all children in the state. The children have to participate so that uh, uh, they will know uh, that these uh, rights accruing to them exist and the whole community should be involved. They emphasize the need for increased awareness and education on child rights as well as the importance of fostering a supportive and protective environment for children. This symposium serves as a platform to um, reaffirm our commitment to ensure that every child is supported, 
and has enjoyed the fundamental rights that are enshrined in the Constitution of Nigeria. That we can develop pamphlets on issues of female genital mutilation, on forced marriages, on child protection, we can do it. So we have a lot of experts that are specialists in child protection law. We will continue to partner with Save the Children, with the Ministry of Borno State, Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development, steering the wheel and the child protection area of responsibility to ensure that all children in Borno State are protected. The protection of the children's rights is unarguably the most important component of a secured future of our children our communities, our state, and Nigeria, and entirely the world. An effort is required to support these young children, gallivanting the streets to secure their future and humanity. Property owners and land occupants of a former burial ground in Umwahia, Abia State Capital, Southeast Nigeria, are appealing to the state government to spare their businesses and its plan to recover government lands. Abia State government had vowed to recover all lands belonging to the state which were appropriated by private citizens in the past. Our correspondent Chiwo Gile tells us more. Part of this area under Isiama Faruku Autonomous Community was a graveyard some 30 years ago. But today has become an area for the living, accommodating shops, hospitals, and warehouses. There are claims that the land was returned to the community some years back after it was not being used for burials for long by the state government. But along the land, there, there was a dispute between the community and the government. But they said they no longer need the burial. And I think they settled with the government and government gave them back their land. So when government gave them back their land, they sold the land to people who created all these structures you are seeing. There is community, but they sell it to ind individuals. So that's there are insinuations that the state government is making plans to recover the lands from the present occupants. The Commissioner for Lands and Housing in the state, Chaka Chukumirije, in a telephone chat, said government is yet to commence recovery or eviction of anybody from the lands. However, the current owners and tenants of the lands are asking the state government to reconsider its position on that in order to avert its tripling effects. I was feel so bad because now, number one, I'm making my business here. I don't know before that here is very aggressive. I'll be working again now. And again, it's not only us again, other people. Bodies, hospital here. There will not be hospital here again now. So. And it should take people's lives. So the uh, government should consider us. They have nothing business to close. Because if you take the land, uh, how will I do the business again? There's also the curiosity of the people on what government proposes to use the land for. In another chat with the President General of Isiama Faruku Autonomous Community, Mr. Obioto, he said government must have recourse to the community anytime he recovers the lands because they belong to the community. Handle the land initially, then at the time, they release it to Isiama, Isiama Fara. Then now, if I thought that they want to acquire it, that means they have to have a serious meeting with Ishiyama for a more especially his, uh, his royal majesty. There are two privately owned hospitals and so many other business concerns now standing in the once known burial ground in Omaha, which will be affected if government evicts the occupants in Omaha for New Central. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says Humanitarian partners will need $4.7 billion to assist 20.9 million vulnerable people in parts of Nigeria, Chad, and five other African countries. And this was disclosed in its 2024 Humanitarian Needs and Requirement Overview Report, published on its website on Thursday. It said 2.2 million children across the Sahel were deprived of their right to education due to school closures. The UN notes that in Nigeria, 7.9 million persons from Borono, Adamawa, and Yobe states are people in need, but the agency will target 4.4 million people with a required funding of $926.5 million. OCHA urged the international community to give generously to ensure the region's humanitarian response plans can be implemented fully by the end of the year.
Coming up, Libya residents' safety threatened by deadly landmines. We have details. After the break, join us again. Thank you for staying with us. South African President Cyril Raposa has announced that his African National Congress will seek to form a government of national unity after failing to secure an outright majority in last week's general election. Following hours of deliberation, President Ramaphosa stated that the ANC leadership has decided to join forces with a broad coalition of opposition parties spanning from the far right to the hard left. The ANC garnered 40% of the vote marking its lowest score ever and the first time since the advent of democracy in 1994 that it requires support from other groups to stay in power. President Ramaphosa notes that ANC negotiators have already initiated talks with several parties, including the leftist economic freedom fighter, the Zulu nationalists and Carter Freedom Party, the Center Right Democratic Alliance, and the Anti-Immigrant Patriotic Alliance. Therefore, agreed that we will invite political parties to form a government of national unity as the best option to move our country forward. The modalities of the government of national unity will take into account the conditions prevailing at this moment in our country's history. The purpose of the government of national unity must be first and foremost need to tackle the pressing issues that South Africans want to be addressed. These issues include... To discuss these, I am joined live on the news by a political analyst, Sipo Sepe. Good afternoon, glad to have you join me. I'll start off by asking... Yeah, good afternoon, thank you for inviting me. All right, I'll kick off by asking you, what is the significance of government of national unity in South Africa? And how does it differ from traditional coalition government? Well, the ANC is trying to avoid uh, a decision that it must take that arises from these elections. First, you have, um, uh, from the far right, you have a party that claims to represent the markets, and that is the Democratic Alliance. And on the other hand, you have a, a number of black parties that feel that uh, the market has failed to South Africa, but that also feel that uh, the past 30 years have not brought uh, material changes in the lives of Africa. And same to last connection with our guest, uh, Sipo Sepe, the political analyst. We'll try to connect with him in subsequent bulletin. Following an attack that killed more than 100 persons in a central village in Al Jazeera state, Sudanese armed chief Abdel Fattah Alban has paid visits to those injured at Al Mangal Hospital in Wad Al Nora. The Rapid Support Forces, RSF, had on Wednesday attacked the village with heavy artillery, killing and injuring many. The war over the past 14 months has killed tens of thousands of people, destroyed infrastructure, and crippled Sudan's economy. Some 8.3 million people have been displaced, with many forced into neighboring Chad, South Sudan, while hunger and starvation are spreading. Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, will face two challenges in next month's election, as announced by the National Electoral Commission on Thursday. National Electoral Commission Chief Oda Gassenzigwa revealed that nine applications from potential candidates were received but the provincial list for candidates released by the commission includes Paul Kagame, Frank Cabineza of the Democratic Green Party, and the independent candidate Philip Mpayimana. Both Cabineza and Mpayimana were also the only candidates permitted to stand against Kagame in the 2017 election. Notably absent from the provincial list is Dia Reguara, leader of the People's Salvation Movement, who was disqualified from the 2017 election. Kagame, who has been Rwanda's de facto leader since 1994 genocide and president since 2000, is seeking a fourth term in office. The election is slated for July 15th. 
And hundreds of deadly landmines and unexploded ordnance steel little parts of Libya after years of fighting, posing a constant danger to civilians, especially children, long after the conflict. Of the relative calm has returned to the oil-rich countries since the Batu for Tripoli four years ago. The United Nations says more than 400 people, including 26 children, have been injured or killed since 2019 in accidents linked to leftover explosive devices. Libya is still struggling to recover from years of war and chaos after the 2011 overthrow of longtime dictator Muammar Gaddafi, with clashes periodically between its myriad of rival armed groups. Still ahead, five bodies recovered in Bolivia bridge collapse. We have details shortly. Join us again. Despite U.S. President Joe Biden's new executive order to better control the influx of migrants at the U.S. southern border, migrants are still pouring into some remote areas, such as Jacumba, California. Under Biden's plan, which went into effect on Wednesday, the government will suspend the right to claim asylum, with few exceptions if the number of people apprehended between the ports of entry exceeds 2,500 people for seven straight days. However, the executive order announced on Tuesday does not apply to unaccompanied minors and allows the government to make exceptions in cases of urgent humanitarian needs. Guatemala. <laughs> Yeah, my change is who and how many and all this stuff. It changes every day, but in the end, the reality is the same: is that the peop the this is the exodus. This is people coming to the promised land. You understand? They're not invading. They're not doing anything like that. They're they've been whether truly or not. They think they're coming to the promise. Recovery efforts have continued on the Rapulo River in northern Bolivia after a bridge collapse, leaving at least five people dead and six others injured. A heavy truck caused the bridge to collapse in the indigenous town of about 18,500 people, 400 kilometers northeast of La Paz. Desde donde se están intentando recuperar los cuerpos que todavía siguen ¿no? abajo del puente. Eh, cinco cuerpos ya han sido rescatados y estamos esperando ¿no? de, los, de los otros tres no, otro tema que, que faltan. Eh, ya han ubicado los cuerpos, ahora estamos esperando una moladora, un, un motor de luz para poder romper el hormigón y también que llegue la, la retroexcavadora o la gallinita. Que... Brazilian President Luis Nacho Lula da Silva has visited one of the areas affected by floods that devastated in southern Brazil in Rio Grande do Sul. The president, during the visit, told those who have lost their homes that the federal government will ensure they get them back so that they can live with dignity. Mm -hmm. 
governo federal não faltará ao povo do Rio Grande do Sul. Aliás, eu disse isso quatro vezes já. E vou dizer pela quinta vez. Nós não vamos faltar prefeitos e companheiros ao povo do Rio Grande do Sul. O governo federal vai cuidar de fazer com que todas as pessoas que perderam a sua casa tenham a sua casinha de volta para poder morar dignamente aqui no Rio Grande do Sul. E não permitam que as eleições deste ano atrapalhem o compromisso de vocês com esse povo. Não permitam que seja utilizado, sabe, com objetivos eleitorais, essa desgraça que aconteceu. Following the revocation of the license of Heritage Bank by the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, some members of the minority shareholders community have called for a probe into the management and directors of the failed bank. The CBN appointed a Nigeria Deposit Insurance Corporation as a liquidator of Heritage Bank. Shareholders Association expressed the need for a probe to hold the bank managers accountable and recover people's money. They also questioned the delay in taking action and suggested alternative approaches, such as removing the management and implementing a CBN-led management to rescue the bank. While a decision to revoke the license provides some coverage for depositors, shareholders are expected to bear the consequences. Oil prices inched up on Friday as Saudi Arabia and Russia provided reassurance regarding their willingness to adjust output agreement. Brent crude futures rose by 0.2% to $80.01 per barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures increased by 0.2% to $75.71. Prices saw a rally on Thursday after Saudi Arabia and Russia attempted to reassure the market and supply pact. However, they are still on track for their third consecutive weekly decline as analysts intercepted, interpreted rather, the recent OPEC Plus meeting as a sign of increasing supply. OPEC Plus agreed to extend most production cuts into 2025, but allowed for gradual unwinding of voluntary cuts. The market awaits further cues for the next steps in oil prices. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, has projected that Nigeria's economy will reach $1.85 trillion by 2029 in terms of purchasing power parity, PPP. And this focus indicates a significant growth trajectory for the country's economy over the next five years. IMF data reveals a steady increase in Nigeria's gross domestic product in PPP terms, rising from $1.36 trillion in 2023 to $1.852 trillion in 2029. The data indicates consistent growth with a notable 5.5% increase expected in 2029. The IMF also predicts that Nigeria's share of global GDP based on PPP will reach 0.78% by 2029, slightly higher than 0.277% recorded in 2023. Now, this demonstrates a steady growth trajectory for Nigeria's economy. The data suggests that Nigeria's economy is gradually expanding and it's expected to continue on this trend. And now to spot stories. Head coach of Bafana Bafana, South Africa, Hugo Bros, has stated that the Super Eagles of Nigeria are under pressure ahead of the Crunch World Cup qualifiers set to take place at the Godswill Akpabu Stadium in Uyo. Boss stated that he is confident in his team's ability to go forward to play well in the encounter. Nigeria will be aiming to get their first win in the Group C of the 2026 FIFA World Cup qualifier when they host rivals South Africa on Friday. The Super Eagles have managed to collect just two points in the opening two rounds, while Hugo boss-led Bafana Bafana started their campaign with a win over Benin before falling away against Rwanda in their second outing. Uh, the pressure is a little bit on Nigeria because they have to win the game when you play qualifiers for World Cup of Africa. You can't lose points at home. So the pressure is a little bit 
uh, on them. At the other side, we believe in it and we have confidence. Uh, we played a very good game in March against uh, Algeria, so that means that we can go on. Football loving fans in Uyo, in Uyo are urging the Spirit Goose to make maximum use of the opportunity to move two steps ahead of their main rival, the Bafana Bafana of South Africa, in Group C of the 2026 World Cup qualifiers at the Godzilla Pabio International Stadium in Uyo. Recall that the Super Eagles lost 0-1 to Uganda at the same venue in a friendly game in March 2015 and in November 2023 drew 1-1 with Lesotho in the commencement of the 2026 World Cup qualifier. That setback, which has put the team in a tight corner, is what the fans are praying against. And that's all on the news. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Presidency has denied 105,000 maxi Naira maximum wage proposal as labor awaits the government offer. Atiku has demanded probe of allegations the federal government spent 3.6 trillion Naira on fuel subsidy payment. We also told you that South Africa's President Ramaphosa has sought national unity government after ANC failed to secure outright majority in polls. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba.